Hey everyone, uh, my name is Sam Keenan, back this week to host our sixth global webinar, uh, IELTS Mythbusting, You Asked, We Answer. Uh, here we're going to provide the answers to common IELTS questions and myths uh, that kind of just surround the test and pop up uh, across the internet and on social media. Uh, I think by this point everyone knows uh, Don, one of the world's most renowned IELTS experts. Uh, Don has hosted countless masterclasses and webinars, including a number uh, that are part of this series. Uh, as well as appearing across a lot of our social media, namely our TikTok channel. Uh, he's here tonight to provide the answers to 13 different IELTS myths uh, in a 30 minute session. And then we'll be answering questions asked in the Zoom chat and on the Facebook comments uh, for an additional 15 minute Q&A after that wraps up. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass over to you, Don. Thanks very much, Sam. Well, um, as Sam said, we're here to discuss myths and uh, you may be wondering what is a myth, uh, M-Y-T-H. Well, a myth is something that many people believe, but maybe it's not true. Or maybe a part of this myth is true. Uh, we're going to discuss some of these things that people believe, and I'll tell you if they are true or maybe if they are partly true or not true at all. So let's start with the first one. This is a common thing. Uh, many people believe that if you want to succeed in your IELTS test, you have to do an IELTS preparation course. In other words, you need a teacher. Well, this is partly true. It's not completely true. I know some people who have developed great skill in English, and mostly it was through working in an English speaking country, or it was through self study. Uh, it may have been through creating their own study plan, listening to a lot of English on the internet. YouTube, for example, making sure they read English newspapers and magazines all the time. All of those things will improve your IELTS score because IELTS tests your real level of English. It doesn't just test your ability to do the test. In other words, if you can improve your English language, then that will improve your IELTS score. Of course, a teacher is great. Be, be someone who, who is not afraid to find a teacher. But that teacher might be a friend. It may not necessarily be at a school. So find English everywhere and find English words and grammar everywhere. Myth number two. I'm living in a country where English is not a first language. In other words, nearly every country apart from Australia or New Zealand or the UK or America or Canada. My first language is Japanese. My first language is Indonesian. My first language is Arabic. So I will never improve my English speaking. Well, this is not true. Because nowadays we are living in a world where you can access, where you can get English 24 hours a day if you have the internet. And this is an important thing. Now you may not have the internet, but you may have a library. You may have a university where you can access those things. What you need to do is work out where can I find English? And if you do find a, a place, a person, uh, an institution where you can practice English, then you can improve your English speaking. Uh, I was talking to someone a little while ago, a few days ago, and he suggested to me, he was learning English as a second language, and he suggested an app called Speechify, and I hadn't heard about it. But it was a matter of an app that turns text into speech, text 
to speech. Now, this is a, a, a great idea. If, for example, you are living in Jakarta, in Indonesia, right? Try looking at the Jakarta Post, which is the English language Indonesian newspaper. Look at it online and use something like Speechify to have that text talk to you. And then you practice speaking those words exactly as you hear them. This is like having a friend online. There are many different ways as well, and we'll talk about some of them as we go. Okay, number three. I heard it's impossible to score more than a band seven in IELTS. Is this true? Well, this is absolutely false. It's not true. A lot of people do an IELTS test and they might get an eight for their listening or for their reading. They might get a nine for those things. They may get a higher score for their speaking, but then they find that their score for writing is less. And this is a problem. It's not just you that has this problem. It's native speakers of English as well, because writing is more difficult. Think about it. You can make many more mistakes when you write. You can make punctuation mistakes. You can't do that in speaking. You can make spelling mistakes. You can't do that in speaking. You can misunderstand the question and answer wrongly, answer off the topic. That doesn't happen in speaking either. So all of these things mean that writing is often about around seven or less, but you can improve your writing by going to the assessment criteria at IELTS.com and looking at the assessment criteria for writing and thinking, where do I improve? Is it spelling? Is it grammar? Is it answering the question? Is it coherence in writing? That means using paragraphs and linking words correctly. Be systematic, be methodical, have a method. Okay, let's look at number four. During the speaking test, I can't ask the examiner to repeat the question. This is false. You can ask the examiner questions. In fact, you should ask the examiner questions. Ask the examiner to repeat the question. Ask the examiner what do you mean by this word? Or I don't understand that word. Two things. You can do this two or three times. If you do it 10 times, the examiner will think, well, maybe your vocabulary is not very strong. So don't do it too much. And when you ask a question, make sure that it is grammatical. Make sure you use good English to ask the question. Don't say how you say. No, that's bad English. Ask, what do you mean? Or how do you say that? There are lots of good things about the IELTS speaking test. It's in a quiet room. It's one to one. You have time to think. And the other good thing about it is you are able to ask the examiner to explain. And they will if you ask. OK, let's go to number five. I will not achieve a high band score if I'm not familiar with the topic in speaking part two. Well, speaking part two, as you know, is you are asked to speak for two minutes 
about a simple thing. It's either describe a person, describe a place, describe an event, describe an object. Now, you may be asked to describe a person like a person who is famous in your country. The thing is, you choose which person to talk about. So you're never asked to say, I want you to talk about the president of your country, or I want you to talk about Albert Einstein. No, 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 no. You're asked to talk about a famous person or a great thinker. So you get to choose. And it's not very important if this person is not particularly well known. You decide who it is. Can I give you some advice about part two? In part two, you are given one minute to make some notes before you speak. This one minute is very important. So practice making good notes. Good notes on a piece of paper and the piece of paper will have 10 words on it. That's all. You've write, written 10 words. And though each of those words you can talk about for 20 seconds. Now you can do the maths. If you have 10 words and you talk about each of those words, for 20 seconds, that's well over two minutes. So relax. It's not a difficult thing to do. Okay, let's continue. Number six, wearing a face mask during my speaking test may affect my score. Well, face masks are a fact of life now, and people are getting used to them. The examiner wears one when he's outside. The examiner is used to wearing a face mask and is used to talking to people with a face mask. So don't worry about it. Make sure that you speak up though. If you speak softly, then maybe the examiner won't hear you very well. But as I said before, the speaking test is good because if the examiner does not hear you very well, he or she will say, can you speak up? And if you can't hear the examiner very well, you can say, can you please speak louder? Remember, use good English when you ask that question and don't be afraid to ask for clarification or for the examiner to speak up, okay? All right, number seven. In order to get a band seven or above, I need to use fancy vocabulary and big words. Fancy, do you know that word? Fancy just means unusual, clever. A word that is uncommon. Well, if you look at the assessment criteria for speaking, if you go to IELTS.com and look at the way that the examiner assesses speaking, you'll see the four criteria there. And the second one is lexical resorts. That means vocabulary. At a band seven, it says you can use uncommon words and you can use words that are idiomatic idiomatic it means words that are used naturally by a native speaker of the language now often these words are very simple words very often a, a, a native speaker of english a person whose first language is english will not use a big word for a normal thing. They'll use words that are natural though. So for example, uh, 
if you have the television, you turn on the television and you turn off the television. Now turn on the television, turn off the television or turn it up, meaning more volume. These are simple words. Turn on, turn off, turn it up, turn it down. But do you see that these are perfect words? These are idioms. This is the natural way to use English. Now, if you can use the perfect words, the idiomatic words, the natural words, then the examiner can give you a band seven, eight, or nine for that lexical resource assessment criterion, the second criterion. They're not fancy words, but they are the perfect words. Now, that's important. If you do know some big long words like nanotechnology or, or biodegradable, that's great. Use them. Use them in the right context. Use them to express meaning. That's great. But it's not important to just use big words. It's important to use the right word. So think about that. Where do you find the right words? It's, it's what you do outside the classroom and every day that will help you find these right words. Reading newspapers, reading magazines, listening to podcasts, contributing and reading blogs on the internet, doing all of those things and you will have plenty of words. Before we leave this, by the way, learning English words, like learning new Japanese words or Arabic words or German words, is a matter of making a list, putting the word in context in a sentence, and revising, 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 revising every day. And the way you revise, the way you review a word is to use it. The more you use the words, the more you will understand them and the better you will remember them. Okay, number eight. I will be penalized if I write more than 200 words in writing task one. Now, remember, writing task one is 150 word minimum. If you write 200 words, not a problem. If you write 250 words, not a problem. The examiner will read all of those words. So this is a myth. This is not true. But remember, the more words you write beyond 150, if you write 250 or 300 words, for task one, you are penalizing yourself because you will make many more mistakes. You won't have time to check your writing at the end. You will probably include information which is not relevant and not necessary. So think about that. I suggest for 150 words, task one, write about 160 or 170. That's enough. For task two, 250 words, write about 260, 270. That's enough. Okay. Next one, number nine. If the opinions I express in my writing or speaking test are different to the examiners, I might lose marks. So. The examiner is a woman and you're talking about driving and you say, ah, women drivers are terrible. Ah, <gasps> no, that your examiner will think that's a stupid thing to say. Don't worry. The examiner might think that it's stupid, but you are not assessed on whether you are saying something which is stupid or whether you are saying something which is 
not acceptable. You are assessed only on the quality of your English. And again, go to IELTS.com and look at the assessment criteria. And you'll see that for speaking, it is fluency, how well you can continue to talk. It is lexical resource, how many words you have and whether you use the correct word. It's grammatical range and accuracy. That is, can you use simple sentences and longer, more complicated sentences accurately? And finally, pronunciation. There is nothing about have you answered the question completely or have you answered the question acceptably in terms of your opinion? Not a problem. Your opinion can be very strange, very irrational, very offensive, and you can still get a nine. So don't worry about that. Okay, let's continue. Now, this is an interesting one. This is something that may or may not be true. In other words, it may not be a myth. Having a certain Western dialect, such as a Cockney accent, and a Cockney accent means someone who comes from the east of London and, and speaks like, I don't know, I can't think of an example. Well, I, won't, I won't ask Sam because he doesn't know either, but it's a dialect. It's a very strong accent. And a lot of English people don't understand it very well. Um, Australians understand it in, in quite well because about 100 and, well, nearly 200 years ago, in fact, more than 200 years ago, a lot of Cockney London people came to Australia. So our accent is influenced by that. But the question is this, if your accent is very strong, if your accent is not easily understood, will it affect your pronunciation score? The answer is yes, it will. And this is because the examiner is asked to listen with an international ear. They are not asked to listen as an Australian or as an American or as a New Zealander or a British person. They are asked to have an international ear. In other words, anything that is understandable by the broad range of people who speak English whether they are French people or German people or Japanese people or Arabic people, <clears throat> then that is okay. But as soon as your accent becomes difficult to understand, it becomes a problem. Because the examiner has to make a decision. Can I understand this person? Is this person maintaining a good rhythm? Is this person using intonation effectively? Are they using a range of features? And one of those features is, can you understand the speech? So be careful. There may be people listening to this uh, webinar who are from the east end of London or they might be from way up north in England, or they might, might be Scottish or something like that, I would advise you to consider how intelligible your accent is to an international ear. And remember, the speaking test is a performance. So consider that. You are performing for the examiner and you want to make the best impression that you can. So modify your accent, please, if you have to. Okay, number 11. You can never get a band eight on your first attempt at IELTS. Well, this is not true. 
I'm sure many people get an eight or better on their first attempt. Unfortunately, most of them have English as their first language. But you don't need to do the test 10 times to get a good score. The message is this, learn English, number one. Prepare for the test, number two. Take the test, and if your score is not what you want, go back to number one. Learn more English, okay? Learning English, all parts of, it, of, of English, being fluent, increasing your vocabulary, improving the accuracy of your grammar, in, in, uh, improving your pronunciation, improving your listening skills and your reading skills, being able to write and use punctuation correctly, improve all of those things, then do the test. If you are not sure where you are, am I a six, am I a seven, am I an eight? I suggest you do the IELTS progress check which you can find on the IELTS.com website. And we will give you an indicative score, a score which, which approximately tells you what you can expect to get in an IELTS test. So this is a, this is a good tool for you. It costs less than the actual test. So it's worth doing. Do it. And if your score comes back as a six and you want a seven, then the message is do some more learning, improve your English, practice the test a little bit more. And then after a few months, not weeks, then do the test again. Okay, number 12. One month <coughs> of practicing IELTS is enough to achieve my desired score. Well, maybe it is, but it depends on where you are. If you are a, a band five, that means your English is just, just okay. And you want to get a band seven, one month is not enough, believe me. If, you're, if you want to go from a five to a seven, it's not one month, it's not five months. It's not 12 months, it's longer. So be realistic. It takes a while to improve. It's taken me 66 years to be able to speak English like this. So be realistic. If though you are at a 6.5 and you wanna get a seven, well, maybe one month will do it for you. So think about that. Okay. Number 13, there isn't enough official IELTS preparation material available online, so I need to go to unofficial sources. Well, this is not true because we at IDP, and IDP is one of the owners of IELTS, the other owner is the British Council, and the other owner is Cambridge, those three uh, organizations produce a lot of preparation material. So can I suggest if you see the IDP logo or the British Council logo or the Cambridge University logo on material, you can be assured that this is genuine and it's good quality. There is some material on the internet which is not genuine and which is not such good uh, quality. So be careful about that. Um, I've suggested other sources already. Uh, and I've also suggested that the main thing is to improve your English. So don't just limit yourself to IELTS preparation. Think about finding sources that help you learn English. And this could be listening to the Voice of America regularly or the BBC or the ABC in Australia. It could be finding a group of people who speak English as their first language and becoming friends with them 
and using English every day. So there is IELTS preparation material. Go to the IDP um, official uh, material. Then there is learning English bro more broadly and go to, go to legitimate and reputable sources for that as well. Okay. Phew. That is 13 <laughs> myths that I hope we have busted. So, Sam, it's over to you and our audience for questions and answers. Yeah, thank you so much for those uh, incredibly expert answers, Don. I think you were exactly on 30 minutes, which uh, is a masterful skill, I think. I, I, I wish I could take credit for it, but I think my mother might actually have um, <laughs> helped me there. Good time management for mothers, I think. They always teach us well. Um, are you ready for the Q&A session? I am ready. All right, question one. Uh, how can I measure my day-to-day -day success in preparation, especially in the writing and speaking tasks? Uh, that's a very good question, Sam. Um, in other words, you have to know where you began and where you have got to. Uh, and this is something that uh, is not always clear, especially if you are at that intermediate level of English and we talk about a plateau, uh, which is a, a difficult word, but it means you are going up like this as you're learning a language and then you seem to be just going like that because you're learning new words, but it doesn't seem to improve very much. Uh, if you are at that plateau around about the band six level, you're thinking, I'm never going to get to seven or eight. But there are ways that you can uh, test your improvement. And one of them is something I suggested earlier, regularly reviewing what you have learned. And you'll find that if you review stuff at the beginning, and I'm speaking from experience, I'm trying to learn Japanese at the moment. You're thinking, you're looking at a thing, what is the, what is the Japanese word for this? Ah, I can't remember. You come back the next day, what is, ah yes, it's that word. Come back the next day, it's easy. That's some very instantaneous feedback that you are improving. And of course, I've already mentioned the progress check. The progress check for IELTS, go to IELTS.com and you will see the link there. Don't do it every day, but do it once and then maybe do it again after a few months. And then you will find that your score will have improved. If it hasn't improved, maybe you're not doing something correctly. Maybe you're not studying hard enough. That's my answer, Sam. What do you think of it? I think that was an excellent answer, Don. I think oh, that covered, thanks, that covered all the bases. Oh, well, I try. Um, perfect answer to kick off. Uh, are you ready for question two? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, what sort of accessibility does IELTS provide to deaf people? Uh, that's a, a very good question, too. Uh, you may have a problem with your hearing. You may have a problem with your sight. You may have a problem with your speaking. You may be dyslexic. That means you're not able to actually spell words correctly. You may have a, a other pro, all sorts of problems. You may have a problem with sitting down and staying still. There are many problems that people have, which are challenges for them. And IELTS will always try their utmost to help those people. So if you have a hearing problem, we can give you this, the listening test with lip reading. You can do a test separate from the other people with one examiner who will read uh, to you and you can see the lips move. Uh, there are also other, there is equipment that can help uh, some people with hearing problems. And uh, if, you're, uh, if you uh, can't see, we can have a Braille uh, test uh, for IELTS. Uh, we can do all sorts of other things as well. So the important thing, if you have a, some problem, get a letter from a medical practitioner, from your doctor, take that letter 
And that letter should say what you need to succeed and take that letter to the IELTS test center and say you need special help and then they will help you. Okay, it's as simple as that. Spectacular answer. Thank you, Don. I think that again covered all the bases. Uh, question three, is it true that in speaking test part three, my answers to each question should be under 30 seconds? Uh, no, uh, there is no time limit. Well, there is a time limit. The whole of part three is only five minutes long. And the examiner will probably ask you about five or six questions in that time. Now that sounds like each answer should only be 30 seconds. Five questions in, um, or six questions in five minutes. But it doesn't really uh, matter to you at all because the examiner is running the test, is controlling the time. So if the examiner wants to move on to another question, he or she will move on. You won't, you, maybe you won't be able to finish your answer. And that's good. If the examiner stops you before you actually finish answering, that's good. Because it means you are giving a lot of language. And the examiner wants to get on to another topic. If the examiner has to wait uh, for you to give more and then say, can you tell me more? That's not so good. So if the examiner stops you and goes on to another question, take that as a compliment because you are giving a lot of uh, language. You are giving, you are showing the examiner that you are fluent, that you have a lot of words, that you are able to express a lot of meaning. So relax. The examiner is in control of the test, will move you on if necessary. So don't worry about uh, how long you, you, it takes to answer a question. Spectacular, Don, thank you very much. Uh, very thorough answer. Uh, question four, I tend to stammer when I am nervous. Will that affect my speaking test score? And if so, how do you think I can tackle this? Uh, there are two types of stammer. There is a very severe one. Uh, that's the one where you struggle to produce every word. And that is a problem. Uh, this goes back to our, my earlier answer. You will need a letter from your speech therapist, from your doctor that says you need extra time in your speaking test. And the, exam and the test centre will give you extra time. So relax. Just make the test centre aware that you need extra time. Then there is the stammer that I think you're talking about, Sam, where occasionally you go, B -b -b but blah, 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 blah. That's okay. Don't worry about that. The examiner will ignore that. As long as it doesn't affect your coherence. What does that mean? If I begin a sentence and the ending of that sentence is after one minute, then it's difficult for the listener to connect the end of the sentence to the beginning of the sentence. And that means you lack coherence. But if it's just a little bit of a stammer, then relax, don't worry about it. It won't affect your school, okay? I'm sure they're glad to hear that. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, question five. Is it true that we always need to finish writing task one before writing task two? Uh, that's a good question, Sam. And the answer is no. You don't have to take those two tasks in order. Some people find that they can do task two more easily. Or they might think that uh, they might find that task one needs a bit more thought and they want to just look at the task and have that a little bit of thinking time while they do task two. This is up to you. It's a personal preference. If you want to do task two first, do it first. If you want to do task one first, do that first. But remember, 
Task one is half the mark of task two. So don't spend 40 minutes on task one and only 20 minutes on task two because task two has is worth more marks, okay? So give that more time uh, and try and make that as good as you can. Task one is important too. Make that as good as you can, but you need to write more words for task two. So give it more time. Okay. Great answer. Thank you, Don. Uh, question six. Uh, in computer delivered IELTS, do I have to give exact answers? Oh, sorry, if I, so I'll repeat that. In computer delivered IELTS, do I have to have exact answers or will I lose the mark for writing in some variation of the correct answer? Uh, that's a very good question too. It's uh, the com just to remind everybody, the computer delivered test is exactly the same as the pencil and paper test <clears throat> in terms of the types of questions, the types of text that you have to read, the types of tasks. So they are exactly the same. So anything I say about the computer test is equally uh, applicable to the pencil and paper tests. This question is, are there maybe two or three different answers which are equally acceptable in the listening and in the reading? And the answer is yes. It's uh, generally speaking, it, it, it's, it will be very clear what the answer is. But occasionally, it may be that you want to give, uh, it, it, we will allow slight variations on the answer in the reading or in the listening. And if both of those are equally good, then the computer will say, ding, yes that one is okay because it's on the list of accepted answers and that's the same for the pencil and paper test the marker will say yes this answer is on the list but a couple of things remember if you're asked to give an abbreviation for example um, february feb that's okay but if you just write fe that's not okay um, if you want to write uh, grams, G-R-M-S is okay. Uh, but if you write um, G-A-M-S, uh, that's not okay. Spelling is important. Acceptable abbreviations are okay. Third point, don't give two answers if they only ask for one, because they will both be marked wrong even if one of them is correct. So if they ask for one answer, just give one answer. If they ask for an, an answer in no more than two words, don't give three words because that will be marked as wrong. And finally, if you have to write a word as your answer, make sure you spell it correctly because if you don't spell it correctly, that will be marked as wrong. I think that covers it, Sam. I think that covers it, Don. I think you are correct. Uh, question seven. Does using the backspace key multiple times for corrections during the IELTS computer delivered test affect my final score in any way? Uh, uh, no. Um, now, I look, I am, I, I'm almost, I, well, I'd be 99.9% .9 sure that this is uh, true, that it doesn't affect you, but to be honest, I've never thought about this. And um, maybe this is, a, if we can give a definitive answer on our Facebook page, that might be the best solution. But the, um, uh, the computer test uses all the functionality of the computer. And in normal uh, use, you can use the backspace as often as you like. And the computer test, uh, I am assuming, would be exactly the same. So um, let's let's make sure that we put an answer on Facebook for this. But I think my my first answer is, don't worry about using the back, backspace too often. It'll be fine. Okay. 
Excellent. I, we'll make sure we put the answer to that in the comments. But um, I also imagine that um, it is unlikely that the backspace mm. causes you to lose marks. Mm. Uh, next question. I've heard that we should not use rhetorical questions in IELTS writing tasks one and two. Is this true? Um, it's not true. Uh, the, uh, it, there is a, a question maybe about um, uh, in a, if you're writing an academic essay for your university lecturer, there may be university lecturers who say, don't do that. But the IELTS essay is not an essay for a university course. It's an essay which shows that you can use English and that you can answer a question directly and relevantly. If you use a rhetorical question, if, for example, uh, you, you are writing about uh, traffic, uh, the traffic pr problem in my city uh, has got worse. What are the solutions? Question mark. Or uh, um, uh, who would not prefer uh, better traffic management? Question mark. Which is a rhetorical question, not requiring an answer. They're both okay. Uh, it is, it is a, a form of English which is acceptable in every context, except maybe uh, in some academic disciplines. But the IELTS essay is not an academic essay in that sense. So do it. And make sure that you use good grammar to do it. When you ask a question, remember, it has to be grammatically correct. Spectacular. Thank you, Don. Uh, we're down to our last question of the night. Uh, right. This person has, says, has said, uh, good evening to both of you. Uh, great to see you live, Don. Uh, can I ask whether I'm great. I can... I'm very grateful to be alive too, by the way. <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, can I ask whether I can make notes on the writing answer sheet? And if I forget to erase those notes, will it be penalized? Uh, that's a good question. So this is about the pencil and paper test. And of course, you can make notes on your um, uh, uh, writing um, answer sheet. Uh, just make it clear that this is not part of the essay. I suggest you simply cross, the, cross that part out. The examiner will look at the essay only. And while we're talking about that, if, for example, you write um, the first paragraph, the second paragraph, the third paragraph, and you think, hold on, that third paragraph should be the second paragraph, that's okay. Just put, a, put it in brackets and put a little arrow to where it should go. The examiner will say, okay, he wants this to be the second paragraph. I will read it like that. So as long as it's clear, as long as it is very clear what you want read and in what order you want things read, then that is fine. So making notes on your page is okay. But remember, you can also ask for extra paper. You can ask for another script just to write notes on or write on the on the um, question uh, paper as well. Okay. Amazing. Uh, thank you very much. That test taker also added to the end of their question. Uh, thank you very much, Don, for the hard work you do for us. Uh, so ah. we're very appreciated out there. <laughs> That's good. I, I'm a happily semi-retired old bloke, so I have plenty of time. <laughs> Any time for webinars to always come back to us. That's right. <laughs> um, unfortunately, that's all the questions we have time for tonight. Uh, remember that if we weren't able to answer your question, uh, just message it to us directly via our socials and we'll do our best to get back to you and answer that question. Uh, a huge thank you to Don Oliver uh, for all of the answers he's provided tonight. I think that was probably 20 plus all up, uh, all answered perfectly. Thank you, Sam. Um, yeah. And thank you to everyone who was able to tune in tonight and uh, watch along with us. Your presence is appreciated. Uh, if you're looking for more study tips, we'd recommend heading to any of our social pages, uh, IELTS Essentials from IDP on Facebook, uh, IELTS.Essentials on Instagram, and at IELTS on TikTok. Uh, wishing you all the best. Have a great night, and thank you again for tuning in. Uh, goodbye. Thank you.